In late January of 2019, New Jersey police found two debit cards, 39 stolen blank checks, and thousands of dollars in cash. The evidence led them to an unlikely ringleader, social media influencer Kayla Massa. Massa's Instagram account is now private, but before she was forced to hide her page, Kayla ran a thriving personal brand. Her page boasted over 300,000 followers, and fed into her personal YouTube channel. Kayla posted a few videos with her sister where they made a typical vlogger content. They hosted Q&As, tried their hand at various internet challenges, and told stories about their personal lives. The channel only garnered 100,000 subscribers. However, YouTube wasn't Kayla's main focus. Her Instagram page was most important. She used her Instagram to post selfies of a wide variety. She even has a fan page dedicated to reposting them. Their profile features an array of faltering mere selfies selfies and pictures with Kayla's boyfriend. One features them wearing matching shirts. His reads Clyde, her reads Bonnie. In a couple of other photos, Kayla is seen showing off a new gold watch and a pair of sparkling rings on her index and ring fingers. Kayla loved looking posh, successful and beautiful. She was good at it. There are several other fan accounts as well as many fake accounts trying to capture Kayla's success by borrowing her likeness. Many influencers use this kind of fame to sell lines of products or merchandise like Mr. Beast or Jeffree Star. However, Kayla didn't create a product for her followers so much as she created a product for herself. After gaining her 300,000 plus following, Kayla started posting photos of herself holding wads of cash. The captions asked her followers if they were interested in making easy money like this, and if they were, they should DM her. The majority of these posts were stories. Fortunately, some of Kayla's followers screenshotted the posts. As you can see, the stories send a clear message. Kayla was making money through some magical virtual wallet. She often posed an ATM receipt or USPS money order slip next to her stacks of cash. Most people reading phrases like, if you have a bank account and want to make some extra bread, would avoid that girl's DMs like the plague. But they weren't Mass's followers. Many of Kayla's victims were longtime followers who watched her tell stories on YouTube and liked Kayla's intimate photos of her and her boyfriend. They knew Kayla's friends and family members whenever they made appearances on her vlog or Instagram. In other words, many victims felt like they knew Massa. And as previously mentioned, Kayla looks successful. She must be doing something right. Sure enough, Kayla's DMs were flooded with people interested in making some extra bread. Prior to posting the scammy stories, Kayla created a system for how to respond to interested investors. For example, if you DM'd Kayla about the money opportunity, she typically responded with a poorly written message saying, quote, so basically, my business partner owns his own business. We deposit a check through ATM, claiming as if you worked. It takes one or two days to process. I would need your online banking and card and PIN. We would have to meet up. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Prosecutors use that very message as evidence against her. As the message indicates, Kayla claims that she's using her business partner's other business to cash in fake checks. These kinds of fake checks usually come from tax write-offs, but sometimes they just came straight from the company's payroll. Then she laundered them through her followers' bank accounts. It's a scam within a scam. Kayla then set up meetings with interested followers. Since they had to hand over extremely personal information, Kayla usually recommended meeting somewhere discreet. Her favorite meetup locations were parking lots, which sounded sketchy to a lot of people. Kayla ensured the victim that their money would be safe and sound. To make sure of this, Kayla instructed the customer to empty their bank accounts. That way, even with their information, Kayla couldn't possibly steal their money. They believed her more often than not. Logically, it makes sense. However, they'd soon learn about other ways to steal funds from an empty bank account. The victim innocently handed Kayla their debit cards, bank information, passwords, PIN numbers, and account numbers. They even gave her their security questions and answers. Kayla thanked them and said they were about to make a lot of money. And by they, she meant her and the rest of her accomplices. It was all part of the system. The cast of characters included Kayla's boyfriend, Jordan Heron, who she dated for a year between March 2017 to October 2018. Lear Massa, Kayla's little sister, was also involved alongside her boyfriend, Erasmo Feliciano. Kayla was the ringleader. Her sister's boyfriend, Jordan, and Feliciano helped Kayla run the scam. Meanwhile, Lear operated a few accounts of her own. William Logan, a friend of Kayla's, operated his own social media accounts. Several, in fact, mainly on Instagram. His involvement helped Kayla's scheme grow to new heights. 
Logan knew other social media users and influencers who were interested in the scam. Logan recruited Alex Haynes, a local car dealership employee in New Jersey, who helped the crew out by setting up more accounts and stealing blank checks. Logan and Feliciano also brought in a mutual friend of theirs named Kevin McDaniels. Kevin set up several accounts on both Instagram and Facebook. Then, Logan approached his friend, Jabril Martin, about the scam. Martin joined the crew, but only operated one Instagram, an Instagram account called at 1HUnit underscore mill. Andrew Johnson, a scammer recruited by Feliciano, had several Santa Claus-themed accounts. One account in particular was called at Savage underscore Santa. Last but not least is Dazon McRae. It's unclear how McRae joined the scam operation, yet very clear how he helped the cause. McRae, also a New Jersey native, used an array of Facebook and Instagram accounts with usernames like YC Woody and Really C Woody. Most of these individuals weren't professional hackers or con men, but they had a clever system to follow, devised primarily by Kayla, who couldn't have stolen the seven-figure sum on her own. Between the nine of them, Kayla's crew stole 1,238 checks. One of the biggest targets was a Nissan dealership in Turnersville. In February 2019, Turnersville reported several strange activities on their business business accounts to local investigators. The dealership showed the investigators screenshots of check transactions they weren't aware of, and there were a lot of them. Turnersville counted around 697 checks cash from their Bank of America account. Kayla and her accomplices cashed three checks for a total of $128,000. After getting access to the victim's bank account, the crew stole stacks of blank checks from the Nissan dealership. From there, they forged their victim's name onto the check, along with a smaller amount like $450. Then they deposit the check into the victim's account. Nissan Turnersville wasn't the only company the Massa 9 stole from. Alex stole checks from the dealership he worked at, Woodsboro Nissan. He happened to work in the payment processing department, giving direct and exclusive exclusive access to Woodsboro's blank checks. The crew also stole checks from a mechanic shop and a couple other dealerships in the New Jersey area. The United States Post Office issued a complaint against Kayla. The complaint is 67 pages long and tells in great detail how Kayla and her accomplices scammed over $1.5 million from 45 victims in the northeastern United States. The report somewhat resembles the alleged criminal escapades of Frank Abagnale. You may have heard of the Steven Spiel film Catch Me If You Can, starring Leonardo DiCaprio as Abagnale. In the film, Abagnale scams banks and airlines by cashing bad checks while dressed up as an airline pilot during the 1960s and 70s. The only difference between Kayla and Abagnale is Kayla didn't have to disguise herself. The report focuses on how she actually stole her victim's money and wreaked havoc on their bank account, which wouldn't have been possible without Kayla's social status. The post office explained the clever methods Kayla used to scam her victims, like money orders and fake checks. Unlike Abagnale in Catch Me If You Can, Kayla simply stole blank checks and forged the necessary information onto the check. She, of course, couldn't do this all alone. Abagnale and many other con men of his day chose the lone wolf lifestyle. By contrast, Kayla recruited nine other people into her scam. As for the mail money orders, those were much simpler. You need a debit card to order money through the post office, and Kayla had a lot of debit cards. Though there was one setback. The post office only allows orders under $1,000. So for Kayla to make the mail orders worth her while, she had to order a lot of them. Once she got the money order in the mail, Kayla, or an accomplice, took the money to a check cashing place and deposited the cash. The process, according to court documents, took about two to four days. According to data collected by the USPS, Kayla's order sizes typically range from $850 to $950. She typically used Western Union, one of the largest financial institutions in the world. They reported to authorities that Kayla and her team cost them $590. $96,000 in fraudulent money orders. Many of their victims suffered losses as well. Kayla, after obtaining access to the victim's bank account and debit card, used the card to buy multiple money orders. One victim, who chose to go by MD on police reports, gave Kayla their bank account info and debit card. Kayla then used the information and card to draft five money orders from the victim's TD bank account. When she gave the mail orders over to her boyfriend Jordan, who deposited the cash back into MD's account, Kayla and company then used the 
debit card to spend the cash and overdraw the account until TD Bank halted MD's account after accruing $3,738 in debt. It doesn't matter if you drain your bank account, you can still spend money that doesn't exist. They'll just come looking for it later. Many of Kayla's victims, like MD, tried contacting her after seeing their accounts were severely overdrawn. But before they could ask questions or make any demands, Kayla blocked their Instagram account or phone number. The victims contacted Kayla through social media and phone number correspondence. They didn't know their address or any information about her or her accomplices. So once Kayla pressed the block button on the other user's profile, that was it. Game over. In case you are unfamiliar with blocking on social media, the digital action lives up to its name. If someone blocks you on an app like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, WhatsApp, you cannot contact that person using your current account. You also can't see their profile or their posts. It's as if they no longer exist. One victim in particular, referred to as CF on police reports, tried contacting Kayla after seeing their account was overdrawn by nearly $4,000. They tried texting and calling the number Kayla gave them, but found that their beloved influencer had blocked them. With no way to contact Kayla or any of their accomplices, CF was left with a $3,900 debt to pay off. Another victim had a similar experience. However, they managed to use a different account and messaged Kayla saying they would call the cops if she didn't return their money. Kayla texted back, do what you gotta do. After Kayla was arrested, she made her famous Instagram account private so no one could see her stories and posts about the money scam. But most importantly, no one could see how she bragged about all the expensive items she bought with her stolen money. Kayla and her accomplices spent thousands of dollars on jewelry, clothes, drugs, and anything else to make themselves look richer than they were. Apparently, fake it till you make it isn't always true. The prosecutors charged Kayla and company with conspiracy to commit fraud and wire fraud. Those crimes carry a maximum sentence of 20 years. She probably didn't think it all the way through when she decided to go for a quick cash grab with her ticket scam. But a scam involving having to ice a foot may just take the cake for the dumbest crime on this list. Number five, Pretty Little Liar. Hannah Valentine started her adult life off on the wrong foot. Looking for a way to make some easy money, she created numerous fake Facebook accounts, which she used to scam people into buying counterfeit tickets for Post Malone concerts and other events. To protect her identity, Hannah went by several aliases, including Natalia Sparrow, Daniela Walsh, Hannah Jane Matthews, and Jessica Lewis. Hannah created fake accounts based on these aliases and posted that she was selling concert tickets. People clicked the link, deposited money into her bank account, and then ended up empty-handed while a mystery girl ran off with their money. Hannah should have thought things through a little more carefully. For one thing, how would the people not find out the tickets were fake? As soon as they got to their concerts, they would know they'd been duped in an instant. Hannah also used her own bank account to receive the money, a mistake no intelligent scammer would ever make. But this wasn't her first scam. About a year earlier, when working at a nail salon, Hannah used a client's credit card info to buy $5,000 worth of beauty products, clothes, fast food, Ubers, and authentic festival tickets for her amusement. Hannah's parents paid back most of the victims. That, coupled with her age, basically got her off the hook. Hannah was given 12 months of intensive supervision and had to complete 240 hours of community service. Things aren't as easy as they seem for her, however. Hannah applied for a spent conviction to wipe the scam off her record, but her request was denied. She also claims to be a laughingstock. According to Hannah, people point and laugh at her when they see her on the street. On top of that, she lost most of her friends. Even her boyfriend dumped her due to the bad press she received after her case. She said she wants to study to be a nurse, but that goal seems out of reach after all that's happened. We can only hope she's learned from her lesson and leaves her dishonest ways behind her. Make sure you're only buying concert tickets from reputable sources. There's not much wiggle room when you buy them through a third party, especially if that party is a scam. Hannah was plain stupid, which is the only reason her victims got any money back. With a little more planning, she might have got away with it. Number four, the scamming mom. 
Jade Cheesley is a mom from Melbourne, Australia, and she scammed the Aussie government out of $102,000 by submitting several false claims to Centrelink. In case you didn't know it, Centrelink is basically their government-sponsored financial assistance program. Jade claimed she was separated, living out of her car with her kids, struggling to get food, and needed government assistance to get by. She received government support for years, and all the while, she was living large in a $565,000 home. She was still married to her husband, and the couple was far from financially needy. They owned two investment properties and had $780,000 worth of cars, savings, and even a boat. Mr. Cheesley owned a roofing company and made $226,000 a year, which was how the couple could afford such lavish things. Jade used the extra money from her scam on many things. One was family vacations. In 2015, she took her family to the Golden Coast, Honolulu, and Movie World, followed by a 12-day trip overseas later in the year. For her husband's 40th birthday, she threw a surprise party at the Craigie Burn Sporting Club after celebrating their anniversary at a luxury hotel the year before. Unfortunately for Jade, her extravagance ultimately led to her downfall. In 2017, the Australian government received tips from the public that Jade was better off than she claimed to be. Once there were too many tips to ignore, investigators raided the Cheesley's home to uncover the truth. Inside the house, they found Jade's cell phone full of incriminating text conversations. These conversations included Jade telling her husband to lie to Centrelink and say they they were separated and asking him what he would do if he had to support her lavish lifestyle all on his own. These texts showed authorities that although Jade was the mastermind behind the scam, her husband was in on it too. All this led to a trial in which Jade pled guilty to dishonestly causing a loss for the Commonwealth and giving false and misleading evidence to a Commonwealth entity. She will now be serving an 18-month prison sentence where she will get a taste of what living a hard life is really like. No more 12-day trips, no more boat rides, and no more extravagant parties, just her and the rectangular cage she put herself in. Number three, self-inflicted. Malcolm Harrison needed insurance money and he may have gotten away with his scam, except he was caught on camera faking an insurance claim. The video depicts him returning from a jog when he almost trips and notices a half broken pavement stone right in front of his house. The footage shows him talking to and laughing with a neighbor before smashing his knee into the stone five times. Malcolm then limps his way back inside, determined to make a case out of his so-called accident. Malcolm thought the CCTV cameras in the housing complex weren't on for for some reason. So he injured himself in plain view of the cameras, cameras that were still running. He actually thought they were fake and just there to scare off any would-be intruders. Once he submitted the claim, it didn't take long for the insurance company to find the video. When housing agents showed him the footage, Malcolm tried to play dumb and insist that the injury was real. He even tried to block the screen so his mother wouldn't see what he did. He even tried to tell police that they were misinterpreting the footage, but the footage was clear as day. He walked up, drove his knee into the pavement on purpose, and then laughed about it with a neighbor. Nobody has ever been caught more red-handed than Malcolm. He also lied to his mom about the whole thing. You see, Malcolm has dyslexia and lives with his elderly mom. She filled out the paperwork for him to file the 6,000 pound claim against their landlord. He maintained his plea of not guilty until he stepped into the courtroom when he finally came to his senses and pleaded guilty to all charges. Malcolm will have to do 200 hours of community service to pay for his fraud. Number two, holiday in Zimbabwe. Thulal Bebe, a UK resident, tried to fake her husband's death to cash in on his 400,000 pound life insurance check early. In September 2016, Thulal sent Aviva a medical consent form and a certificate from a hospital in Zimbabwe claiming that her husband had died of pulmonary embolism on August 9th of that year. He was actually working a long shift at Charing Cross Hospital in London that day, nowhere near Zimbabwe. When Aviva agents uncovered this information, they sued Thulal and she was charged with a single count of fraud. The judge handed Thulal a two-year sentence, but it was ultimately suspended. She was a mother and a first-time offender, so the judge decided she could rehabilitate and pay her dues in other ways, deeming a prison sentence unnecessary. However, her nursing license was suspended until further notice, but that didn't stop her from applying for another nursing job the day after after her suspension hearing. She intentionally left any information regarding her conviction off her application and worked 35 shifts before internal checks within her workplace discovered the truth. This was the final straw. Another hearing was held and the board decided there was no other option but to strike her off the medical register. They ruled her conduct was fundamentally at odds 
compliance with the association's standards and that allowing her to continue her practice would reflect badly on the agency. Thrulisle and her husband were in deep financial straits, owing around 30,000 pounds before the scam. Some speculate if Mr. Bebe was in on the scam and that he let his wife fake his death to escape his debt. However, the court found no evidence of this and Mr. Bebe was let off without any charges. Number one, cold feet. Brian Muyepa is a former Royal Artillery gunner and he sued the British Ministry of Defense for 3.7 million pounds. While he was in the military, he allegedly was in a cold tunnel with wet boots for five hours and that was what caused him to develop trench foot. Trench foot has been around for centuries. It claimed the lives of 75,000 British soldiers and over 2,000 American soldiers in World War I due to the high amount of trench warfare taking place. Trench foot causes pain in the extremities and heightened sensitivity to cold weather. It was common in the trenches of World War I, hence its name. The condition was widespread due to cold weather mixing with the water inside the trenches. Symptoms of trench foot include blisters, blotchy skin, swelling, a feeling of numbness, pain when exposed to extreme heat or cold, and loss of mobility. In many instances, soldiers had to get their feet amputated because of their condition. Unfortunately, the ones who couldn't get an amputation never made it home. Muyepa claims the Ministry of Defense breached their duty of care towards him and is seeking 3.7 million pounds in reparations, including 800,000 for the loss of his army career and 1.7 million to pay for caretake. Muyepa claims he can't walk more than 100 meters, even with his walking stick. He claims he can't stand for longer than 10 minutes and his wife takes care of all of the household chores. We're not sure why that last bit is worth suing over, but to each his own. However, a video of him dancing Dancing at a barbecue says otherwise. The video posted on Brian's wife's Facebook page outraged the Ministry of Defense. It blew his whole case out of the water, as he's much more mobile than he claims to be. On top of this, one of Brian's army comrades told the Ministry of Defense that Brian talked about packing ice blocks around his feet to fool the tests into showing that he had trench foot when he really didn't. Now the Ministry of Defense is convinced the whole case is a fake. They don't plan on giving Muyepa one penny of his 3.7 million pounds claim. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you think is the biggest scam to you in life.